It was 20 years ago we're talking about the Bali bombings. Megan Norris has written a book, Out of the Ashes. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. It must have been a pretty emotional time for you and everybody involved. What are your thoughts when you think back 20 years, Megan? It's like uh, the death of Lady Diana or 9-11. Everyone sort of remembers where they were, don't they? Everyone remembers where they were when they got that news and how they got that news. Megan, with uh, reading the book, this is a beautiful tale about courage, about resilience and all manner of things that make human beings great people. Can you give us an outline of the book? Yes, I can. This is the story uh, of Therese Fox, who was the most burned survivor to survive the Bali bombings in Kuta in 2002. So Therese was a young nurse. It's a very heartwarming story, very very tragic in places, but very inspirational. And uh, Therese was a young nurse and went on a dream holiday, her first overseas trip without her two young children, Alex and Katie, who I think were seven and nine at the time. And she went on a holiday with her friend Bronwyn Cartwright, uh, also a nurse. They'd spent ages saving their money. She was Therese was a sole parent, so it was very hard slog to save the money to go. And they were really excited about this holiday, which descended into the dream, you know, the dream holiday, descended into the nightmare from hell, uh, which obviously they couldn't see. But with, with hindsight, she looks back and she says, you know, this holiday was doomed from the start. It Originally, it was intended as a, as a holiday for four. And uh, the younger sister of Bronwyn Cartwright, Jess, Jessica uh, Barnard pulled out because she couldn't raise the money. Another friend pulled out because she changed jobs and couldn't get time off. And then um, Damien Fox, who is Therese's twin brother, had a bad feeling of impending doom and urged them to change their plans and go to Fiji. He said, don't go to Bali. It's too dangerous. And bear in mind, they booked this holiday a year before they went. They booked it right after 9-11. And so, you know, he was he was very worried about them going to Indonesia. And Teresa's attitude was, you know, I'm going. This is I've worked really hard. I'm going on this holiday. It's a million miles miles away from Ground Zero. What could possibly go wrong? Um, jeez, Megan, we uh, we covered it extensively last week. I spoke to Professor Fiona Woods, who's very heavily involved with the burn side of things, and a lot of the people involved with the Bali bombings were getting uh, airlifted straight to WA. We also spoke to uh, Peter Hughes, who uh, went through the trials yeah. and tribulations as well. So what was it that was so, so, so poignant about the story that Teresa had that when you were documenting and putting it to paper? Well, Therese was also in Paddy's Irish Bar, where Peter Hughes was that night. And so he was at the bar, and Therese had left her friend on the dance floor and gone to the bar to get a drink. She saw an Indonesian man walking past her towards the dance floor, and then minutes later the bomb went off. He was a suicide bomber. All the alcohol behind the bar ignited and turned it into an inferno. That's why the people at the bar were so horribly um, burned, Peter Hughes included, and the footballer Jason McCartney was also at the bar. Therese was the most burned survivor to survive. She became known by her doctors in the Burns Unit at Concord Hospital as the miracle of Bali because she really is a miracle. She had sustained 80, uh, burns to 85% of her body, all third degree burns. They were, that's horrific, you know, that's full thickness burns where they go through layer upon layer of skin and fat and tissue. In the heat of the explosion, her face had melted off, her sweat glands had melted, the soles of her feet fell off. She was. She had large pieces of skin falling off, and she was found dying in a doorway by an off-duty soldier who carried her out of the carnage and to, and delivered her to a colleague, Rodney Cox, who was a United Nations peacekeeping soldier on leave from Dilly. He was from Melbourne. He was on leave from duty in Dilly, and he helped her walk. And she walked 1.5 kilometres on so, the soles of feet that then fell off. Oh. They were so burned. And they, he helped her back to his hotel, where two um, Australian teachers, Kath Byrne and Radha Vanderworth, had just arrived from Australia that day on their holiday in Bali. And basically, he handed Therese over, and they helped to keep her alive. They did so by co pouring cool bottled water all over her. Now, a lot of those burn survivors leapt into the nearest swimming pools or stood under showers to try and cool their burns. A lot of those people develop really like a serious life-threatening infections from that. But Kath Byrne, who was teaching in Brunei at the time and was used to a tropical climate, knew exactly what to do. 
So she said, no, don't put her in the pool. They poured cool bottled water from behind the bar and from the hotel kitchen. And that one thing really did help to save her life. So she was delivered to a hospital where she spent the next 36 hours fighting to stay alive. No one expected her to survive. And she was then too sick to be evacuated back to Australia. So when the evacuation began, and it was actually the biggest aeromedical evacuation Australia had ever done since the Vietnam War, that they were airlifting all the casualties back to Australia. And whilst Perth played a big role in that, Darwin was the designated hospital. So the Royal Darwin Hospital activated an emergency plan. And all these people came to Darwin, which sort of became a triage hospital, and then they were taken to other places. So a lot of the Perth people still went to Darwin. And uh, Therese was airlifted to Concord. But they they left her on the tarmac at Denpasar because no one they were told to take the people who were going to survive. And no one expected that Therese would, that she could possibly survive the journey back to Darwin. And she did, against all odds, she did. And then on to Concord, where she spent many, many, many months Megan, it's an amazing story, and uh, your book doesn't just cover the events, it also gets into the political side. The amazing thing for me last week, documenting the stories, was uh, the resilience of people, but also the fact that they were struck by this amazing event that had happened, but a lot of them weren't worried about the self-preservation. They were going back in, helping people, doing all amazing events. We've heard about Jason McCarthy, Peter Hughes, but there were so, so many of them. We won't take all the thunder out of the book, uh, Megan. Tell us a little bit about the political uproar before and after the event. During, uh, after the event, at first, it, no one really knew what had happened. Was it an accident? That's when the first bomb went off. It was sort of suspected it might have been a cylinder explosion, gas cylinder. Then 20 seconds later, another bomb goes off over the over the road at, at Sari Club. That was the car bomb that took out the Sari Club. Basically, the sort of feeling was one of uncertainty and fear. And there were there were concerns about there might have been other bombs and where might they be. And there were certainly bomb threats in the week that followed in Bali. There, there were almost by the day there were bomb threats. And still the, the Australian families who had loved ones missing were pouring into Denpasar to look for them because people didn't know if they were in hospital or buried under the rubble or, or, or whether they were dead in the morgue. So um, a lot was going on that people didn't know about behind the scenes. From the minute that happened, uh, the, the explosion happened in Bali, the cabin, there was an emergency meeting of the uh, sort of anti-terrorist group in Parliament. There were a lot of high-level meetings going on in Australia. John Howard was notified very in the early hours of the morning. Things were put in place. Military police uh, from the federal police were immediately sent over to Bali. A plane full of people was sent from Darwin with a, a, a sort of a specialist medical team was sent from Bali to assess how many more medics they needed flying in. There was a lot of things. There were people on the ground helping. There were a number of ADF forces on leave at the hotel Therese was taken to. So they were immediately helping in the effort there. But there was a lot going on. And, and then it became, and it was delicate, it became a combined Indonesian police investigation combined with the Australian Federal Police. But we were there really to support, not to involve ourselves. So it was a difficult thing because, as one of the policemen said to me, if that had happened here in Australia and there had been lots of Indonesian, Indonesian people injured, would we have allowed the Indonesian police in to take control of an investigation? Highly unlikely. So it was politically very sensitive. Megan, thanks very much for joining us. I got you on short notice this morning, but uh, it might be nice to recap and uh, talk about Teresa. How is she uh, getting on these days? Well, Ter- Therese is an absolute miracle. She really is. They, they called her that, and it's because she is a miracle. And against all the odds, she decided last year she wanted to write a book. Um, she wanted me to write a book. She rang and asked me if I'd be willing to do that. I've followed Therese's story for 19 years. So I met her 19 years ago on Mother's Day, and she was still in a full-body pressure suit, terribly injured. And I remember thinking, I don't know how anyone can come back from such injuries, but she has. And so she she's, she returned to work. She was told she would never work again, never live independently, never raise a family, never wear makeup, never drive a car. And she's done all those things. She worked all the way through COVID in Victoria when they were on Code Brown. She did double shifts. She decided not only did she want to write a book, she wanted to return to Bali. And I was amazed at that because 
she'd always said she would never, ever, ever return to Bali. And yet she decided it was time. I think there was a sense that she wanted to write a book as a legacy to her grandchildren so that when she's gone, there'll be something for them to know what really happened to her. She wanted to do it to honour her friend, Bronwyn Cartwright, who died in Paddy's Bar that night. And she decided she wanted to go back because she turned 30 in the Burns unit in 2002. And she turns 50 this year, 20 years later. And she felt that she needed to go back. In order to move forward, she needed to go back and put old ghosts to rest and say goodbye to Bronwyn. And, and that would allow her to move on. And she went back with a crew from 60 Minutes. Unfortunately, it hasn't allowed her to move on. It's resurrected all the pain mm. yep. and all the trauma that she suffered all those years ago. And she is really struggling right now. We wish her all the very best. That was one thing that surprised me last week. Some of the people we spoke to, including Peter Hughes, has been back to Bali. In fact, he's been back something like 20 times. It's an amazing story about human spirit. It's uprising. It's also uh, a tragic uh, tale. But thank you very much for joining us this morning, uh, Megan. It's a terrific book. It's titled Out of the Ashes. Thanks for joining us on ABC Wide Bay. Thank you very much for asking me. Thank you.